see you all here as part of this effort to promote dialogue between the United States and Latin America. We're very excited and very honored to have uh, Professor Jorge Dominguez as our moderator here today. A, he's been an enthusiastic supporter of educational activities concerning Hispanic issues. So please give a warm welcome to Professor Dominguez. Thank you, Nicole. This is a program that has been organized by the Harvard Forum uh, on Hispanic Affairs, a group of undergraduates uh, that has worked very hard on a variety of projects over the years, as you can see uh, in the program that has been distributed to you. Uh, also, the program has the biographies of uh, our speakers and a, a small summary of the events um, um, that this group has sponsored over the years, so that my role today is somewhat uh, simpler as a result. At the end of the remarks, and each of our speakers will speak for about 15 or 20 minutes, uh, as you know, uh, those of you who have been here before, uh, you can line up uh, behind the microphones and ask questions, um, and we will have, I'm, I'm pretty sure, a fair amount of time uh, so that we will have an opportunity for discussion. Uh, we begin um, with uh, Jorge Salaverri, who is Minister of Counselor um, of the Embassy of Nicaragua to the United States. Uh, he will be focusing on a discussion of democratization in Nicaragua with particular attention to the role of elections uh, in his country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dominguez. I will also like to thank uh, Nicole Caso for the wonderful uh, organization of this program and all of you who are part of the Hispanic Forum and uh, all of you who are present here. I am going to briefly discuss and to share with you some of the changes that have occurred in Nicaragua since the elections took place in, 90, in, in February of 1990. Very briefly, I'm going to talk about the elections uh, themselves, and then we will move to the changes that have occurred. For sure, that you all remember what was going on in Nicaragua during the 80s. There was a bitter civil war in that country. It was because of that and that there was a necessary to bring that word to an end that President Oscar Arias from Costa Rica brought a peace initiative in 1987. This uh, peace initiative that was discussed in Esquipulas was known as the Esquipulas to accord was the initiation of what would evolve in the elections in Nicaragua of February of 1990. The period that mediated between the, uh, the beginning of the peace initiative and the elections was a very difficult period because what was looked after was to have free and fair elections in Nicaragua, which meant that the people of Nicaragua would have the opportunity to express what they felt about the political and economic situation of their country. Uh, there was a second meeting of the Central American presidents in February of 1989 that was more precise in the results as to how the elections would take place in Nicaragua. This uh, meeting that was held at the, was known, the accord that was signed at that meeting was known as the Tesoro Beach Accord, 
because of the place that was where the meeting took place in El Salvador. Uh, this meeting brought about the commitment to have elections no late than February 25th of 1990 in Nicaragua, that these elections would be monitored by the United Nations, by the Organization of American States, and that there would be a reform in the Nicaraguan electoral law. Uh, later on, the parties involved in Nicaragua in the elections, which were, on the one hand, the Frente Sandinista de Liberación Nacional, with Daniel Ortega as its candidate, and the other coalition of parties that was known as Unión Nacional Opositora Uno, that had as a candidate Violeta Barrios de Chamorro, agreed also to invite the Council of Freely Elected Heads of Government to join the United Nations and the OAS to monitor the elections in Nicaragua. The Council of Freely Elected Heads of the Government was presided at the time by former President Jimmy Carter. When the elections took place in Nicaragua in February of 1990, uh, with several thousands of people monitoring the elections as well as journalists, the results that, that were expected by the polls that had been taken, well, well, they were not too accurate, to say the least, because of about five polls that were taken by North American firms, the five of them were, were wrong. Uh, polls taken, for example, by Univision or by Washington Post, ABC News, they were all wrong in their predictions. Most, all of them gave a uh, the FSLN uh, candidate, Daniel Ortega, 8 to 15 percent point lead over Violeta Chamorro. However, there were some other polls that were taken by Latin American firms, the Costa Rican poll firm and a Venezuelan poll firm, and those polls were accurate. However, they were, they were not known in the United States. In spite of that, well, the results now is very well known by everybody. The Nicaraguan people had the opportunity to express their will and they decided that it was a time to have a change in the government of Nicaragua. And this is the way that President Chamorro came to office through the most supervised elections that has taken place in Nicaragua and probably in all over Latin America. Since then, things have occurred in Nicaragua that has really changed the, the country as a whole. What our government found in Nicaragua in 1990, in April of 1990, when the Chamorro government took office, has been well described, I would say, by the Minister of the Presidency of Nicaragua, Antonio Lacayo, who says that Nicaragua at the time was a mix of Poland, Lebanon, and Haiti. And it was similar to Lebanon because 
when we came to office, we had a, a, still a war going on. There were two armies in Nicaragua. There were the Sandinista army and the army of the Nicaraguan resistance, better known as Contras. At the time, there were 22,000 members of the Nicaraguan resistance. It was uh, Haiti because of the degree of poverty, the income per capita in Nicaragua had declined from about $900 in 1978 to less than $400. And it was Poland, or similar to Poland, because of the high degree of statization of the economy. The best farms, the best industries were in the hands of the government. The banking system had been nationalized. We had a a hyperinflation that probably is the, uh, the highest hyperinflation that has existed ever in the world. Somebody told me this morning that probably in Germany sometime in the, during the, after World War II could have been probably worse. But that is, this is a situation that we found, a very highly polarized country. We found that the foreign debt of Nicaragua had passed from one and a half billion dollars in 1978 to 11 billion dollars in 1990. During the same period, on the other hand, exports have declined from about $800 million per year to less than $300 million per year. So the situation that we faced was extremely difficult and is still difficult because we have a long way to go. The, the two most important, however, achievements that the Chamorro government has reached over these two years in government is one, to put an end to the civil war that was bleeding in Nicaragua. Over 22,000 members of the Nicaraguan resistance were persuaded to disarm. The Sandinista army has been reduced from 80,000 to about 20,000. And other than having achieved peace in our country, we have been able to control hyperinflation. During the first 12 months in government, the accumulated inflation rate in Nicaragua was 55,000 percent. The following 12 year, months, which are about to end this month of April, we expect that the inflation rate has, will be either zero or minus one or minus two percent. There is uh, a lot of things to be done. And it's a very difficult path 
But with the policy that the Chamorro government is applying, one of national reconciliation and governing with the consensus of the different political, social forces of the society, we Nicaraguans all, those who are who were with UNO, those who were in the Nicaraguan resistance, and those who were Sandinistas, are determined to bring Nicaragua out of the hole that we fell into in the decade of the 1980s. We are a country that is now at peace. We are in very good relations with our neighbors. We have very good relations with the United States and with all countries in the world. In this path, in this of recovery that we are going at this moment, we have the support of the Nicaraguan people, as has been expressed in recent polls taken by polling firms that were accurate in their predictions about the electoral results. We do have the support of the people and the government of the United States and many other countries in the world. Actually, just last week, we had a meeting in Washington with the consultative group of donor countries, representatives of donor countries, where promises of assistance that exceed $600 million for this year were obtained. The Nicaraguan delegation was accompanied by representatives of the different political parties, labor unions, and entrepreneurs associations that came with the Nicaraguan delegation to support the economic program that we have put in place in order to make Nicaragua again a prosperous, peaceful country. We have scheduled elections for 1996 according to the Constitution. We expect to have total free elections where the Nicaraguan people would decide whether this government that they freely elected in 1990 has done its, its job well or not. This government will be happy to hand the government to the either party or group of political parties if the Nicaraguan people in free and fair elections decide to do so. We don't want to have war anymore. It was too painful, too bitter, and thank God it's a matter of the past. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Salaverri. Now we move on to um, Jorge Ramon uh, Hernandez Alcerro, the ambassador of Honduras to the United States. Welcome. May I speak to yes, please. First of all, I would like to uh, thank the Harvard Foreign and Hispanic Affairs for inviting me to speak at this uh, prestigious university. And uh, I want to uh, especially thank Nicole Caso for all the time that uh, she has dedicated 
to, uh, for us to have this dialogue today. It is a great honor for me to be at uh, your university. This dialogue on the future of Central America comes at a historic moment. Since the recent transformations which have occurred in the world and also in our region mark the trends of change and outline the challenges that we will have to face at the dawn of the 21st century. For the purpose of analysis, I have identified the six following important and recognizable trends. The end of the Cold War, the concern for economic efficiency, the scarcity of financial resources, the trend towards economic integration, the democratization tendency worldwide, and the concern for the environment. It is common wisdom to point out the disintegration of the Soviet Union and of the Eastern Bloc countries, which resulted in the end of the Cold War as a relevant factor in the international environment. However, I cannot stress enough its importance. The changes that such events have brought about in the international power game have transformed the way of thinking worldwide, continuing to alter the map of alliances, ending all conflicts, and starting new ones. These changes also affect the power relations inside our own countries, since they have either put an end or modified relations of dependency that developed during the Cold War. At the same time, the failure of the centralized and state-dominated economies, economic models has given renewed credibility to the market-oriented economic systems. The causes for the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Eastern countries were basically economic. Not only had the system overextended itself politically and militarily, but the economic structure that supported it succumbed as a victim of centralization and unproductiveness. The principle of economic efficiency advocated by the Western market-oriented systems was newly justified by the setback experienced by the economists in the communist countries. A, sec a third trend is the scarcity of resources. The scarcity of resources is also closely related to the changes taking place in the world now and those that will take place in the future. Since the traditional sources of financing have closed many of their windows or have diminished their lending considerably. Political and military patronage lost significance with one, when one of the two super superpowers went broke. Countries that used to receive great sums of money for strategic or ideological reasons have seen their financial sources go dry. Another important source of financing are the multilateral institutions. Only the nations conducting economic reforms will benefit from their financial support. Only nations that are preparing themselves to compete in the world's economy will have real possibilities of growth and development, and at the same time, be able to maintain the capability to repay the credits that are extended to them. On the other hand, private banks that supply the financial needs of developing countries in the 70s no longer have the petrodollars and their exposure in Latin America has declined considerably. A fourth trend that points to the future in Central America 
is the integration of markets. The 20th century will be essentially remembered by the military alliances that dominated the international arena at that time. The 20th century, for its two world wars and the division of the globe in two ideological blocks. The 20th century announces itself with a movement towards the integration of new and, large, and larger economic spaces. This is not only about the establishment of a unified market in Europe in early 19, 1993, but also about the economic integration of the developed countries of Asia and the expansion of the North American Free Trade Agreement that is to create a huge economic block of about $6.2 billion uh, or trillion dollars in regional gross product and a market of 362 million people. Now, not only the economic aspects herald the future orientation of our region, there are also important political factors. Latin America anticipated the political transformations that later took place in Eastern Europe and Africa, where authoritarian regimes are being replaced by new forms of government tailored in Western democratic style. Latin America, if you recall, began its democratization process in the late 70s. In real terms, the 80s were not a lost decade as it has been frequently said. Although it's true that the economic situation deteriorated considerably, almost all the countries of the continent made significant prog progress towards establishing free and popularly elected governments. To conclude with the setting up of this framework of rec recognizable international trends, I would like to mention that the concern for the environment is also having a definite impact in the future of our region. What has, have been the repercussions of these international trends in Central America? In the 80s, the Central American region went through a period of instability and economical regression caused by internal armed conflicts and international tensions. Although the peace negotiations for the region began in 1982, the end of the Cold War has been a key factor in finding political solutions. The electoral defeat of the Sandinistas in Nicaragua and the peace agreement in El Salvador have many security implications. On the one hand, the possibilities of a conventional war in Central America are at a record low. On the other hand, peace has changed the perceptions as to the type of security threats that the Central American countries face today. Finally, pacification brings back the matter of regional security agreements. Two other factors also have an influence on security issues in the area. First, the processes of economic adjustment and regional peace have opened up the discussion of military expenditures. Second, the peace and democratization processes create a trend favorable to the reaffirmation of civilian authority and military professionalization. The issue of military expenditures has already emerged at the level of bilateral military relations and more recently at the level of donor countries and that of the international financial community. Maybe every, everyone had ignored or admitted discussing this issue during their economic negotiations with recipient countries of financial assistance. For the Central American countries, highly dependent on the international assistance to finance the deficits of their respective balance of payments, the problems brought about by the scarcity of resources, badly needed savings to be invested in productive activities, and requirements for efficiency in public spending are not easy questions to resolve. Central America is faced with an ongoing debate with respect to military expenditures and on the future role of the military 
in the newly democratized societies. In the case of Nicaragua, the Sandinista's electoral defeat gave way to reform in the Sandinista Popular Army. In El Salvador, the military stalemate, stalemate that preceded peace negotiations has resulted in a redefinition of the role of the Salvadorian Armed Forces. Panama abolishes defense forces on, after the U.S. invasion in 1990, and the Guatemalans are conducting their own peace negotiations. In Honduras, my country, a public debate has started over the new role of the armed forces. Given the generalized perception that the threats facing the country have changed, besides performing the traditional role of defending the territory, guaranteeing peace and public order, and safeguarding the Constitution, the Honduran armed forces are attempting to modernize their structure and are considering the renewal or the assumption of new functions. The public debate centers around their role in the protection of citizens, property, national resources, and the environment, as well as a more active role in community development and disaster relief activities. In the international field, our armed forces will have to face the threats brought about by terrorism, drug trafficking, and armed smuggling. I would like to refer now to the conditions created for the strengthening of civilian authority and the professionalization of the armed forces brought about by the pacification of the region, especially El Salvador's, and by 10 years of democratic rule. In effect, these two facts have generated two main expectations from the public regarding the evolution of military institutions. First, it is widely expected and demanded that the authorities in charge of keeping public order improve their record for respect of human rights. And second, it is also widely expected that the military institutions will seek to play their new role in Central American societies through professional adherence to the principles of hierarchy, discipline, seniority, merit, efficiency, and technical training. Let us turn now to the repercussions in the economic field. While the civil wars were taking place and Central America was the subject of world attention, subtle changes began to occur in the economic structures of our country as a way to stabilize the economies, to turn them competitive, and lay the basis for sustained economic growth. All of the Central American countries are implementing now economic adjustment and liberalization programs. This is not only a response to a call for economic efficiency, but a way of dealing with the situation described above of limited financial resources to promote development. In the short term, the adjustment has proved to be harsh for our populations, especially for the very poor. However, our countries are trying to overcome their closed, inefficient, and unproductive economic systems and find their way to improve standards of living which past economic models of development failed to deliver. The political military conflicts of the past, compounded with the distortions of our economies, made the state apparatus and public spending grow disproportionately. We created inflationary pressures, discouraged private investment, hindered investment, increased the cost of our export products, created an unfair social system, and rode on the idea of an imaginary bounty. Awaking to reality has been unpopular and painful. Today, Central America is in the process of learning to live in peace in a highly competitive and demanding world. Having said this, the economic change that is beginning to take place in Central America must not be taken for granted. The change will reach the point of no return when our people perceive in it the necessary element of equity. Therefore, the success of the modernization process 
depends to a great extent on the spreading of its benefits to the majority of the population in the medium and long term. An economic liberalization program which does not create new opportunities for the entire population or promotes larger disparities in income distribution will not be politically or morally justifiable and therefore will become unsustainable. We could start another cycle of economic and political deterioration, pressures to return to interventionist economic systems and to authoritarian regimes might be difficult to withstand. The end of conflicts in Central America, the homogeneity of their political regimes and the similarities of their economic policies being implemented have facilitated a return to economic integration under a new conception. Given the openness of the Central American economies, our countries are integrating by reducing tariff barriers among themselves and with respect to the rest of the world. By the end of 92, the Central American countries will have in place a free trade zone that will include agricultural products. By 93, they will have a common tariff for products from outside the area. It is expected that by 96, a free trade zone will be formed with Mexico, Venezuela, and Colombia. Also, consultations between Central American countries and the Caribbean nations, members of CARICOM, are at work. Without doubt, Mexico's inclusion in NAFTA will have important effects over the future of our regional economy. The first of these effects will be that of accelerating integration among Central Americans and the strengthening of their relations with the Caribbean. Free trade will also encourage further movement towards economic liberalization, including the investment and the financial regimes. In closing, I would like to comment now on the repercussions of democratization in Central America. Democratization in Central America has been achieved through many efforts and many sacrifices, as our friend Jorge Salaverri from Nicaragua was saying. We cannot take for granted that democracy is here to stay, no matter what we do or don't to support it. Democracy in Central America is fragile and needs to constantly nurture its legitimacy and strengthen its institutions. Democracy is achieved through a permanent process of consolidation and refinement. Ten years of democratic practice in Central America, the economic changes that have taken place, the pacification of the region, and in particular the, the reforms in the political institutional framework of El Salvador, will put pressure on the establishment throughout the entire area for changes and for a better performance of legislative and judicial branches of government. Decentralization of executive functions, professionalization of the military, reorganization of police forces and intelligence systems, and for improvements in the electoral systems and in the accountability of public servants. All this amounts to a true transformation of the state. Two other challenges will have to be faced by the Central American countries in the years to come. One relates to social reform, the second to the environment. In the medium term, the modernization of Central America will also call for a profound revision of our social system. I'm not familiar with the specifics of each Central American country, thus I will refer briefly to the case of Honduras. In the past 25 years, Honduras has made significant efforts to develop its social sector. From 65 to 89, mortality rates decreased by 53%. Moderate to severe malnutrition rates in children less than five years old was reduced in 30%, while fertility rates declined in about also 30%. During the same period of time, the number of children in primary education increased by 33% and primary education 
Today reaches in Honduras 92% of children between the ages of 7 and 13 years old. In spite of this commendable progress, Honduras social indicators demand that many and severe social problems be solved. Infant mortality is 60 deaths for every 1,000 live births. Infants constitute only 4% of the Honduran population. Nevertheless, they account for a third of the total deaths occurring in the country. Notwithstanding the progress made, malnutrition levels continue to be among the highest in Latin America and the Caribbean. And despite the high enrollment in elementary schools today, 42% of the population is illiterate, and adults make up to 30% of that group. According to numbers released by the World Bank, Honduras has not overlooked investing, investing in its social sector. In the last decade, the Honduran government dedicated between 25 and 33% of its public expenditure to the areas of education, health, nutrition, water, and sanitation. What is then that social indicators continue to be negative? According to the same World Bank report, and I quote, social indicators that show poor health, malnutrition, and continuing levels, low levels of literacy are fundamentally related in Honduras to the continuing isolation of poverty groups, especially those in rural areas of the country, unquote. Consequently, and I, want, and I want to express this, one of the greatest challenges which Honduras must face in the year 2000 is precisely how it will expand its social programs to include the extreme poor, particularly those in the rural areas, so that their living conditions can improve. All these will have to be done within the economic limitation of a country as Honduras, and within the economic limitations that foreign assistance available for this purpose impose. The social transformation of Honduras will require a sustained effort to change established patterns which do not allow our population to take full advantage of its limited resources. It will be a very difficult task. Finally, a last area needs to be mentioned among the factors shaping the future of our region. It is simply amazing how environmental concerns are becoming a political and an economic issue in Central America. A few years ago, little consideration was given to soil erosion, deforestation, the preservation of endangered species, or the protection of water supply. Nowadays, these topics go hand in hand with the preservation of national resources, public sanitation systems, agricultural methods, the use of land and harvesting practices, adequate policies, legislation, and regulations. All are matters today of daily concern. In countries as ours, the protection of the environment has much to do with the methods of exploiting and managing natural resources as with fulfilling the basic needs of our population. It has also a lot to do with cultural attitudes and education. In order to meet the challenges of protecting and preserving the environment, the Central American countries will have to devise policies and legislations that can successfully deal with these attitudes and lack of education and practical training in such a way that they address the critical problem of economic sustainability of the population. These are, I believe, the main trends of change in our region. As we Central Americans enter a new century, we face an inviting new era, an era of great challenges, yet an era of renewed hope in ourselves and in our promising future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Hernandez. Uh, now we move to um, Juan Jose Caso Fanjul, the Ambassador of Guatemala to the United States. 
who will speak on peace and democratization in his country. Well. Thank you, Professor Dominguez, and uh, thank you very much to the Harvard Forum on Hispanic Affairs for the honor of being able to speak with you this afternoon. As you're probably aware, our young democracy is emerging from many years of authoritarian regimes, social injustices, and poverty levels that are simply not acceptable. Guatemalans deserve a better way of life, and we are committed to do everything in our power to bring about the structural changes that will result in benefits for every member of our society. <coughs> when President Serrano took office in January of 91, he pledged his commitment for peace, mentioning that after 30 years of armed confrontation and violence in the country, it was imperative that all Guatemalans, particularly those in the government, to make the achievement of peace and reconciliation one of the fundamental objectives. We're looking forward to a total peace for Guatemalans. That is to say, a peace that, il that will not end with a ceasefire, but will result in the elimination of the causes that motivated the conflict. We desire and we hope a very prompt end to domestic strife, the conditions of poverty, and the fragmentation of our society. This could not result from the simple signature of documents that could become pieces of historical efforts, but a process that would include all sectors of society with a full commitment to the peace process. Additionally, structural changes and institutions would have to be revitalized or created in order to support and strengthen our democratic system. Our objectives are to arrive at peace and strengthen our democracy. Number one, by encouraging the active participation of all sectors in basic decision making through dialogue and consensus. To strengthen the legal system. To ensure respect for basic human rights and the dignity of our nation, and to establish sustained economic growth and social development. As we look forward to the task ahead, we must not lose track of the fact that what has transpired in the past is a process that has been arduous and complex. The Esquipulas Accords have provided a framework within which peace could be negotiated. And it established that peace could only be the result of an authentic, democratic, pluralistic, and participative process establishing social justice and respect to every individual. In that spirit, the National Reconciliation Commission was created and an initial contact was made with the leadership of the Guatemalan Revolutionary Unity, the URNG. The first of these meetings took place with the political parties in Madrid, Spain. This meeting was also attended by the National Reconciliation Commission and a personal representative 
of the Secretary General of the United Nations. Other individual meetings took place with the private sector, with the Guatemalan labor unions, with cooperatives, religious groups, <coughs> academics, and professionals urging that negotiations would be geared towards a peace process. Since taking office at the beginning of last year, President Serrano was very clear in stating his total commitment towards a lasting peace. In his own words, the President said that absolutely nothing was more important during ma my mandate than to do all that is in my power to expel from our land the death, the injustices, and conclude once and for all the armed conflict between brothers and deliver to the children of our nation a peaceful country ready to offer to every Guatemalan the opportunity of integral development. Since the initiative for total peace was offered last April and taking into account all the previous discussions that had taken place with the Guatemalan Revolutionary Unit, preliminary discussions expanded the consensus to find a solution to stop the armed conflict and to strengthen our democracy. The basic proposals included in the Total Peace Plan were to end the insurgent activity resulting from negotiations that would lead to the disarticulation of suppression and of counterinsurgent operations, the improvement in social and economic conditions, the end of the armed conflict with free resources and place attention on the inequalities that exist in our country and that are causes for dangerous social tensions. Respect and strengthening of our legal system would be essential. Total peace can have permanence only if the state strengthens the judicial system where the law applies equally to all citizens. Further development of the democratic process would be essential by creation and involvement of institutions, particularly those that would strengthen local regional governments. The negotiations have taken place in an atmosphere of privacy and discretion with all parties having the opportunity to either renew old friendships or forge new ones and thus conduct their deliberations in a positive climate. It was delightful to, to see members of uh, our government, uh, members of the Army, exchange pictures of their children with the leaders of the insurgency and uh, renew relationships that they had had a lot of them had gone to school together and uh, had simply taken different ways and were now fully committed to talk and to find peace for themselves, for our children, and for future generations. Uh, at the end of April of last year, the delegations of the URNG and the government met in Mexico to establish the areas where agreements had to be negotiated in order to reach total peace. The result of this meeting was an agenda for peace with 13 points. Democratization, human rights, strengthening of civilian power, the role of the armed forces in a democratic society, the identity and the rights of the indigenous people, constitutional reforms and the electoral system, the resettling of displaced communities due to armed conflict, socioeconomic aspects, 
agrarian reform and the basis to incorporate the URNG to mainstream political life with negotiations for a final ceasefire. The chronology for the implementation, compliance, and verification of the accords would precede the signing of the firm lasting peace agreement. In the following round of conversations, which concluded in July of 91, after what was called the Querétaro Accord, named after the Mexican city where the negotiations took place, a consensus was established among all parties, declaring that in order to further democracy, it was imperative to eliminate political repression as well as electoral fraud, military coups, and destabilizing actions that would threaten the process. Additionally, the accord reinforced the importance of respect for human rights and the subordination of the armed forces to civilian authorities. As the peace process continues, the building of institutions that will ensure and support democracies continue. One such institution is the Peace Fund, uh, better known as FONAPAS. It was created last year without external funding and is being used to benefit the people that have suffered as a result of the armed conflict. FONAPAS has obtained a needs assessment chart for all regions of Guatemala based on the stated requirements by each community. A poverty chart of the country has also been developed and the poorest regions of the country have been the first to benefit from FONAPAS projects. Coincidentally, the poorest sections of the country is where, where armed conflict has taken place. There are two FONAPAS projects currently being implemented in the agricultural and textile industries. These should create jobs for thousands of displaced persons in the very near future. The ensuring of human rights respect is an area that has been given considerable efforts. Our human rights ombudsman, who is selected by Congress, has done an outstanding job at making sure that every case where violations are occurred is properly documented and uh, that transgressors are placed before the law. Uh, his report, which comes out twice a year, enjoys credibility both in our country as well as outside and a number of notorious cases have been resolved uh, with the help and aid of our human rights ombudsman. Uh, one specific that comes to mind is uh, what is called the uh, Santiago Massacre, where uh, 12 civilians were killed and uh, as a result, uh, a strengthened Attorney General uh, protested as uh, as convictions to to the perpetrators of this crime were given a 16-year conviction, with the Attorney General countering and looking for the maximum sentence. Our Attorney General's office 
has been very instrumental in pursuing human rights abuses and making sure that transgressors are brought before the law. Uh, the President's own concern has led to the creation of a ministerial office that supervises and coordinates executive actions to promote the protection of human rights. The, uh, the administration of justice is an area that causes great concern. We have uh, a system of justice administration that is over 100 years old. It is very archaic. And uh, under the leadership of uh, the new president of the Supreme Court and the commitment of Congress, we should, we should soon have a new penal code that will provide for, for oral uh, application of, uh, of justice and, uh, and hopefully will help in promote the type of just society that we're, that we're looking for. One of the areas that uh, we cannot uh, accomplish all these things without is sustained economic growth. We are we're pleased to see that in 1991, our economy grew at a 3.2% growth. Our international reserves, which at the beginning of the year were in the neighborhood of $14 million, were up to $536 million by the end of the year. We had a balanced budget, which was something very novel. Increases in government revenues uh, were dramatic. They went up by 50%, but income tax alone increased a hundredfold. I mean, about a hundred percent. And uh, in order to continue with the social programs that our government is looking for, we need to continue making reforms. And uh, there is a fiscal reform package in Congress right now that should provide the necessary funds in order to focus on some of our basic problems. Uh, in the area of nutrition, for example, nearly 60% of the children between 3 and 36 months have symptoms of malnutrition. And more than one third of all children between seven and 11 years old show evidence of significant smaller size for their age. In housing, at the end of 1990, the quantitative and qualitative deficit was estimated at around 860,000 units. Formal housing institutions have not been able to address the sector's need due to lack of sound projects, inadequate finance, gaps in the legal framework, and administrative weaknesses. In education, despite efforts for a number of years to build schools and increase the number of teachers, education coverage is very unsatisfactory. About 73% of children between five and six years of age do not attend school. Attendance increases are only 61% in primary school. 
and 40% of laborers have not had access to formal education. Currently, 52% of our population over 15 years of age are illiterate. And the figure reaches 70% in rural areas. We have a tall order. Uh, and the implementation of this strategy to transform Guatemala requires the commitment and dedication of all citizens and also the efforts of every sector in our society. May we find the support and understanding from our friends abroad to achieve these goals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Castle. Now we have uh, uh, some time for uh, questions and answers, and let me uh, urge those of you who have questions to ask uh, to line up uh, behind the um, uh, two microphones, and I will be calling on you in a moment. But I thought I would begin by asking a question myself of each of our three uh, panelists with regard to uh, U.S. relations with your countries. One way to think about U.S. relations with Central American countries over, say, a 20, 25-year period has been a cycle of neglect and panic. Uh, as the United States is ending a period of panic with regard to Central America, it is possible that it might begin a cycle of neglect. My guess would be that none of these countries wants the United States to ignore them. But the, let me put the question a little more specifically. In the case of Nicaragua, uh, Mr. Salaveri described um, the important efforts of the Nicaraguan government with broad support from many political parties and social sectors to obtain varieties of levels of aid. But he also described the very severe economic uh, losses that Nicaragua suffered over a period of years, the gap between what needs to be accomplished uh, and the resources available remains very large. How then uh, would you like, in a realistic way, knowing that it is not just one superpower that went broke, but in some sense two superpowers that went broke, only one went broke in a very serious way, much more so than the other. How would, how would the government of Nicaragua think about and what kinds of steps has it been taking to try to uh, ensure the, a larger flow of economic assistance from abroad for national reconstruction? Let me ask the three questions and then go back to each of you. In the case of Honduras, um, Ambassador Hernandez spoke uh, very thoughtfully about um, the role of the armed forces in civil military relations. There are many reasons why the Honduran armed forces are large. One reason has been U.S. relations with the Honduran armed forces. As we enter again a period different from that of the 1980s, um, how would the government of Honduras uh, see the relationship between the U.S. and Honduras at the military level? What role, of any, would you like the United States government to have with regard to um, the size, the permanent the mission the resources of the Honduran Armed Forces, what kinds of assistance would you like to have or not have? In the case of Guatemala, again, sort of looking over a period of about 20 years or so, one of the uh, striking things is that whereas U.S. relations with Honduras and Nicaragua have been very intense for good or for ill, U.S. relations with Guatemala have been much more distant uh, the United States and Guatemala have had uh, rather weak relations of one sort or another. Guatemala is the country in Central America where in the recent past the U.S. government had least influence. As you think about a new level, uh, a new moment in relations between the United States and Guatemala, what would be the kinds of things, if any, that you would like to construct in this time ahead different? from what may have occurred over the past 20 years. So let me begin with Mr. Salaberry. 
Thank you. <clears throat> the question of Professor Dominguez is how the government of Nicaragua is planning to cover the gap that exists between what has been lost and the needs that the country has. As I mentioned, uh, we are receiving economic assistance from many countries in the world, including the, Un the United States. Nicaragua was also receiving a very generous assistance from other countries during the decade of the 1980s. <clears throat> Those countries now, however, compete with Nicaragua, countries from the Eastern Bloc, which used to assist Nicaragua, are now in competition with Nicaragua for foreign assistance. So it's impossible to count on those countries for assistance. But I want to be very clear about what is what we are planning to do. Because although foreign economic assistance is badly needed in Nicaragua at this moment, we don't want to continue relying forever on foreign assistance. And what is what we can do in order not to rely on foreign assistance? The only way to do so is to become productive again ourselves. Is to be able to, be, to bring our production levels at least to the levels that we had back in 1978. But of course, that is not a goal. That will be just a step. We will have to bring our production, our exports, from less than $300 million per year at this moment to at least the $800 million that you, we used to export back in 1978. What is what we can do? Well, we Nicaraguans have to be productive. One of the things that we are doing in order to achieve that is that we have undergone a privatization process. Because those companies that have been in the hands of the government are not productive is the private sector that has the responsibility to produce, to generate the foreign exchange that we need in order to pay the large debt of $11 billion that we inherited, is the production of the private sector of the Nicaraguan people that we need in order to bring about the improvement in the social services. And the only way that we can do that is creating a framework of economic activity that would, that would reward investment, that would reward the efforts of people who produce, not to tax them away the, the, the efforts the fruits of their efforts. So what at this moment, after seven years of constant decline in GNP, we achieved this past year a leveling of that decline. We didn't have a decline, but we have zero economic growth. This year, we expect to grow by three, four, and probably even 5%. It is not enough, however. In order to recuperate just the levels that we had in the past with necessities that are much bigger than in the past because our population is larger now, well, the only way that we can do it, Professor Dominguez, is with the effort of the Nicaraguan people, and at this moment also, 
with the economic assistance of friends abroad. Ambassador Hernandez. Um, Professor Dominguez' uh, question was how uh, do we see the relation of the United States with the Honduran Armed Forces and if there is anything that uh, we would like to change in that, uh, in that relationship. Um, I'll try to be very brief. I think that, uh, first of all, the um, United States has been uh, very supportive of the democratization process in Honduras. And we would uh, like the United States to continue lending that support to the democratic institutions in my country. Second, um, the United States, yes, had a lot of influence in uh, shaping the Honduran armed forces as we know them today. I believe that the United States has uh, both a responsibility in terms of maintaining certain levels of assistance to the Honduran military, and uh, on the other hand, has also a responsibility in um, stimulating the armed forces to assume uh, a new role, given the changes that have taken place in the Central America, Central America, re Central American region. Uh, this, I think, would be uh, mainly um, the two ideas that I would have uh, on, your, on your question. Good. Thank you. Ambassador Caso? Yes, Professor. Your question related to the more distant relations between Guatemala and the United States. And I would say that our commitment to democracy is what is bringing us together. We are a proud country and we see a number of commonalities that we have with the United States. We wish to protect the environment. We are committed to fighting the, uh, the war on drugs and we wish to increase trade uh, in as much as our interests and uh, our commitment towards strengthening democracy and these specific areas can be focused, we will have a number of areas for mutual cooperation. Thank you. Uh, now we will go to the questions. Uh, when, before you ask your question, please state your name and then ask your question briefly. Gentleman over here. Dr. Newman, my question to the Ambassador of Guatemala. Over the years, I've been reading in American press, newspapers, magazines, hearing in radio and television, and if they all have been wrong and telling us lies, please tell us so, because I've never been in new countries, so my information is to the American media. According to American press, anywhere between 150 to 300,000 people have been tortured, raped, murdered, disappeared, which means murdered, over the last few decades. Most of them by presumably directly or indirectly, if, even so not all, by the armed force, police, intelligence services of your country. I know that the topic is the future of Central America, but the most famous, certainly in this area, Spanish-American philosopher Santayana said, those do not understand this past. Those who do not understand the past are doomed to repeat it in the future. So you refer to the justice system. Did the justice system, I heard about the ombudsman, have enough people to bring the guilty to the law because you cannot have democracy without legal system, crime and punishment. I noticed your editorial board member of a newspaper, Chronica, does your magazine and other magazines feel free without threat of torture, disappearance, and death to discuss those matters? Do they? You also connected to the agricultural industrial uh, institutions of Guatemala. Are the workers free, to, are free without danger to organize? Are the 
peasants free to organize? In other words, is the past the past, or is it still in the present, in the future? And most importantly, the armed forces and the police, have they been changed, or the same people still commanding them before? Now, if my information from American media is incorrect, please tell me so. If it's correct, please comment. Let me try to answer each one of your questions. Uh, Guatemalans are totally committed to change. The past is something that we want to put behind us and as freedom becomes available, freedom is being used. Uh, you mentioned uh, my involvement in, in the press. Uh, I can tell you that uh, since the democratic process began, it is a process that has to be continually protected and strengthened. But our publication has been able to touch the most controversial subjects without ever feeling any threats or without receiving any sort of indications that what is published is wrong. I, I am ambassador of Guatemala uh, after being a critic uh, of the government um, because I believe that there is a political will to make the necessary changes in order to make ours a true democracy. Changes have been made, very bold changes have been made in the hierarchy of the armed forces in order to ensure that the same goals are followed by all sectors of our society. And uh, in terms of, of agricultural workers, uh, there, are, there are labor unions not as strong as we would like them to be. Other sectors of the, of the economy are developing and they have to compete in world markets. They have to, they have to make sure that their workers are paid commensurate to, to other workers. And uh, I would say that in general, in general terms, there is, there is work to be done, uh, but the commitment is there. Thank you. Gentleman over here. Um, Reg, Reg McKean, I'd like to ask the Nicaraguan representative to explain why the, um, what is, as the, can he explain why, uh, as he mentioned several times in his talk, um, American polling organizations did a universally disastrous job in per predicting the 1990 election in his country, whereas apparently Latin American polling organizations did an accurate job. I'm wondering why that's the case. It's a fair question. Uh, I think that the main reason for this is that the American firms subcontracted the services of Nicaraguan polling firms. And those Nicaraguan polling firms, the Nicaraguan people were afraid that they were not really separated from the 
government that was in place at the time. And probably they were not too candid in their answers. The Latin American polling firms probably understanding a little bit better what was going on in Nicaragua at the time brought in their own pollsters, their own personnel to conduct the questions. Other than that, I don't see any reason why prestigious organizations like ABC News and Washington Post would be so wrong. I hope in the future our press will do a better job of understanding your country so that the cycle of neglect doesn't happen again. Over Nick, here. Nick Pearson here. Um, Ambassador Caso, I spent six weeks in Guatemala in 1989 in various regions of the country. Found it uh, a truly fascinating and beautiful country, but also very tragic. Um, I had many extraordinary encounters with uh, Guatemalans of uh, various sectors of the society, most not too many of the very wealthy, but of the middle classes and the wonderful Maya Indians who make up 60 percent of the population. I have two questions for you. One is I'm extremely concerned about the, the well-being of the uh, largest uh, tropical rainforest in Central America, which is in the El Paten region of Guatemala. If one looks at a land satellite uh, photograph, one sees that that forest is still largely intact, which is really remarkable for uh, when you realize what's happening worldwide to rainforests. In our, in our present historical moment. Uh, can you give me some assurance that El Paten will be protected, uh, and if so, how? The second question I have to ask you is, uh, with these reforms uh, that are taking place, that you say are taking place in the Guatemalan government, can you assure me that the uh, right-wing death squads will not uh, be uh, eliminating the uh, courageous people who uh, stand up for uh, for change. I'm talking about the ordinary people, not not members of the elite. Certainly. With regards to your first question, uh, the tropical forest of of Peten is one that uh, unfortunately has not been as well preserved as, as you uh, had indicated. Uh, there, there are some, uh, some satellite pictures that show uh, a deterioration over the last 10 years. And this is of utmost concern uh, to our government. And every effort is being made to ensure that we protect our tropical forest as we consider it one of our most important resources and uh, certainly one that can deteriorate very rapidly unless the measures uh, that are being taken uh, uh, be become permanent in, in, in their nature. Now, with regards to uh, to right-wing dead squads, I cannot uh, I cannot comment uh, specifically uh, but uh, in general terms, uh, there there are there are indications, and and this through through our experience in the press, uh, that uh, that uh, the uh, the atrocities that uh, used to be committed in the past uh, have been reduced 
uh, substantially, and to my knowledge, there are, there are no death squads operating at this particular point in time. If, if, if there were any to appear, uh, our government would do everything in its power to make sure <clears throat> their activities are stopped. Ma'am? I have two questions addressed to all three ambassadors. Do you believe that peace and democracy are satisfactory to those who suffer under poverty and inequality in your countries? Also, where do the arms come from for armed conflict in such poor countries? Can you afford weapons when so many of the people in your country are so poor? Why don't we go down the table? You are completely right. We cannot afford more weapons. That is why precisely in Nicaragua, the administration of Mrs. Chamorro has reduced the army from 80,000 men to about 20,000 in two years. That is why the Nicaraguan resistance was voluntarily disarmed, 22,000 of them. Most recently, in the last 60 days, we started recollecting, collecting the weapons that still are in the hands of the civilians in the government, in the, in the country. And we collected 19,000 rifles, hand grenades, grenade launchers, all sorts of weapons that we cannot afford, that we don't need. Where those weapons came from? They came from the superpowers. They, we were a theater of the Cold War. In Nicaragua, at the end of 1979, when we had the revolution that overthrew the Somoza dictatorship, the, there was an army, the National Guard, that at the peak of its power never had more than 7,000 men. And then the mistake was made to engage in the creation of an army that reached 80,000 men that we don't need it. So you are right, we cannot afford weapons. That is why we have reduced the army, have collected armed from civilian from civilians' hands, and we still estimate that there are about 60,000 weapons in hands of civilians. We hope to collect them so that these people will turn to work to produce for the country and for their families. That is what we want to do, and that is what we are doing. Ambassador Castro? Yes, uh, I uh, agree completely that peace and democracy are not enough, particularly for our poor. And uh, what we wish is to create the conditions to eliminate poverty. That's why the social programs that have been designed as part of the strategy of this government require all the resources available to make sure that these social reforms are made and that poverty is fought and hopefully one day eliminated.
in terms of your second point, uh, we feel that our commitment, uh, and we're very hopeful that sometime, perhaps this year, we will have a total peace accord. That, that will release resources that can be placed into these social programs that our government is so committed to. Thank you. Ambassador Hernandez. Yes, I, I think uh, that your question uh, addresses a, a very critical uh, matter. Um, and this is, or that is, if people in countries as the Central American countries should be given uh, peace and democracy, uh, or if uh, they should be given uh, economic advantages or better standards of living. Um, your question uh, suggests to me that the idea that some people uh, in the past has, had, have had um, and have proposed that we could do without democracy or peace uh, in order to attain higher levels of economic development of our social justice. Um, I personally feel that any government, and in particular uh, governments in Central America, have to have a balanced view of the different uh, factors that are involved uh, in, in governing. I don't think that uh, we can do without peace. Uh, the proof is that when we didn't have peace in the Central American region, not only the political conditions deteriorated, but also the economic situation of the uh, region was in shambles. So um, I would say to you, I don't think that peace are, and democracy are sufficient. They are part of what our people are entitled to. Uh, but we do need peace, democracy, and, us, and also social and economic development. On your second question, uh, where does the arms come from? I think that Jorge Salaverri has already responded to you. Uh, they came from the industrialized countries. We don't produce any weapons. Uh, but I think that the changes that have been introduced in the Central American region after peace uh, was achieved are tremendous. Um, in the case of Panama, I said it during my remarks, Panama has abolished its uh, defense forces. Costa Rica doesn't have an army. Nicaragua has slashed to a third its armed forces. El Salvador will be soon uh, reducing the size of the armed forces by half. The Honduran armed forces, I, as I have been, uh, as I try to explain to you, are also in the process of not only reducing uh, the size of uh, uh, the armed institution, but also of assuming a new role within, within society. So there is a big change going on uh, in the Central American region. Um, hopefully, all of these changes will end up in a, a regional security agreement. Honduras has proposed to the neighboring countries a, a security uh, treaty by which we would all uh, negotiate uh, levels of armaments and levels of armed powers, power that could allow us to um, um, channelize those resources, very scarce resources, to uh, social development and economic development projects. Thank you. Gentleman over here. My name is Mark Horak. I have a question for Ambassador Caso. 
What is the uh, status in the negotiations between the refugees in southern Mexico and the <coughs> government of Guatemala for the refugees' return? And secondly, what is the objection of the government of Guatemala to granting the guarantees of safety and so forth uh, on the return of the refugees? Um, an accord has, uh, has been negotiated for the return of the, of the refugees and they will, they will start returning uh, beginning this year. Uh, we're, we're expecting uh, approximately 10,000 refugees to be, to be resettled within, uh, within the next year. The gentleman over here. My name is Mark Seibel, and I'm a Neiman Fellow here. I'd like a, uh, to follow up a little bit on the woman's question about the militaries in each of your countries to elicit a little specific information. Um, uh, the first being, what percentage of the budget is now destined to military uh, spending in your countries, and, and where is that uh, program to go? Um, what percentage of that budget or in dollar amounts is programmed now for acquisition of military equipment? And then finally, what percentage of aid programs from the United States or dollar amounts, if you have it, um, is intended as military credits? Maybe we can go down. Ms. Salaver? Yes, I can tell you that uh, the budget for the military in Nicaragua has been, has been uh, cut by more than half that what it used to be. cannot give you the precise figure, but it has been cut by about 50 percent. With regard to the, uh, uh, the assistance uh, that we are receiving from the United States that is uh, for weapons, I can tell you this zero. None, none of the assistance that is being provided to us from the United States is for military assistance. Actually, as I, and I would like to repeat, because I really like the question of that lady, we don't need weapons. That is what has caused the problems that we have had in the past. We didn't kill each other with, uh, with uh, agricultural tools. We kill each other with weapons. That is what all the weapons that we have collected that I mentioned that were in the hands of civilians, as well as the weapons that were in the hands of the Nicaraguan resistance, were destroyed on the spot in front of the representatives of the Organization of American States. And we hope that we would be able to collect all those that are still in the country so that we will dedicate ourselves, our efforts, our lives to work and to produce. Ambassador Castle. Yes, uh, the military spending as part of our budget has been reduced and uh, we do not get any, any military aid from the United States. Ambassador Hernandez. Um, the military uh, budget of Honduras um, equals or is around $45 million. Uh, as a percentage of our GNP, 40, $45 million would be uh, about 2% of our, of our GNP, just as a way to compare it to uh, social expenditures that is, uh, has been during the past decade between 25 and 33% of GNP. I'm sorry, of public expenditures, about 10% of GNP. And uh, in terms of the um, military assistance that Honduras uh, receives from uh, the United States, uh, this year we will uh, receive around uh, $22 million of, economic, of uh, sorry, military assistance of a total of about $120 million of, of uh, assistance, economic uh, uh, development, uh, et cetera, from the United States. Uh, next year, 
the um, proposed figures for Congress dropped that amount to $10 million. Uh, the uh, trend here has been uh, um, to a, a, a very uh, sharp decline of uh, military assistance on the part of the United States. I believe it reached its uh, peak in uh, 1985 with around $60 million, and uh, it has gone down ever, ever, ever since then um, to the low of, of $10 million next year. Well, we have two uh, more questions, and, and we are limited, limited in time because we are supposed to end promptly. Let me, therefore, take the two questions. I hope they're both brief, uh, and then we would need brief answers, the gentleman and then the lady. Uh, I'm John Barrett. Will someone comment whether Central American governments can exercise leadership in regard to the tragic and explosive situation in Haiti? Is that important for your people and for peace in the region? Will it be a precedent? What can you do about it? And a question from you. Uh, I'm Tatiana Brenes, and I'm from Costa Rica. And I basically have two questions, which are, first, when you speak of social reform, what kind of social programs are you trying to implement in your country? And what priority do you give to especially issues related with children? And uh, secondly, if there are so many things that the money m might be destined for, for example, uh, even though you're talking about reduction in um, arms, how can you basically destine the money to go to those social reforms when there are basically, you know, there's a big gap between the high class and the low class, and um, how will that money be able to be destined for the people of the lower incomes? Thank you. I realize that one could say a great deal about either or both of these questions. Let me have to be very brief because we do have to end, and we'll go down, so this is your last chance. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, first, to the, in relation to the question of the gentleman about Haiti, which is a very tragic situation, this situation has been discussed in the Organization of American States. And the position of Nicaragua in regard to Haiti is that we are for bringing about the democratic process that they have already set in place. It's a complex situation and is going to be hopefully solved soon in the uh, Organization of American States. With regard to the question of uh, this lady, um, yes, of course, that uh, any resources that are being released from the military are going to be used in those social programs that we badly need. Uh, there are so many. The needs are enormous, are tremendous. In the case of Nicaragua, you know, the refugees that have returned to Nicaragua after the end of conflict from your country, from Costa Rica and from Honduras, are in the thousands. They demand jobs, they demand uh, medical assistance, education. And those resources that we are not using in the military now are, devo are being devoted to those programs, which is what we need. But of course, we need much, much more. But above all, we hope that we will be able to create employment for the people so that people will be able to, pro to provide for them to themselves, to their work. So we hope to achieve the levels of investment in Nicaragua in order to provide employment for the Nicaraguan people that is tired of work and is more than willing to live in peace and produce. Ambassador Caso? Yes. Um, for the very first time uh, in, in history, we, we have been moving towards a totally democratic hemisphere. Uh, and one cannot overemphasize the importance of a continent uh, sharing the same system of living. You can talk about similar values, you can talk about common problems, you can concentrate on the real work that needs to take place in order to improve the lot 
of our peoples. Uh, any exception to this type of system, that is, any, any exclusion uh, of a democracy uh, from uh, the hemispheric system uh, is a tragedy. And uh, uh, we, we certainly do hope that, that Haiti uh, joins back uh, in the democratic uh, hemisphere and uh, that we will soon have a totally democratic America. In terms of, uh, of the second question, um, the, uh, the gearing of resources to, to the poor classes uh, are done by implementing the social systems through, through resources that uh, in our particular case at least will, will hopefully come through taxation reforms and other measures that will generate the necessary resources to, to implement uh, the programs that will bring up a lot of the poverty areas of the country into a more dignified uh, way of life. Ambassador Hernandez. Uh, very quickly to answer Mr. Barrett's question on Haiti, uh, the Honduran government has publicly stated that uh, we are ready to uh, contribute with whatever means are necessary to reinstate democracy in Haiti. Uh, secondly, uh, Honduras has been one of the three uh, Latin American countries that has received uh, um, refugees from, from Haiti. Um, to answer uh, Ms. Brenner's uh, question on social reforms, um, when I talk about social reform, I'm talking about optimal allocation of human and economic resources. And I'm also talking about targeting the most, uh, the most vulnerable uh, sectors of our society, mean mainly children, pregnant women, and the elderly, and also targeting uh, health and primary education. Let me uh, end with a last uh, thought of my own. As I listen to the questions uh, from many of you and I listen to the remarks of the panelists, I was struck um, by a great deal of agreement. I think there was a great deal of agreement in this room about the very severe problems that these three countries still have. I think there was also a great deal of agreement about a number of important goals that members of the audience and members of the panel share and even on many means that they share. I suspect that a remark like that could not have been said after the end of any panel discussion on any Central American country over the last decade. And thus it is a moment of hope in Central America. It is a moment of hope to heal wounds and to build new societies. It is also possibly a moment of hope in the United States to heal the wounds that we ourselves had with regard to Central America. But there is the risk, as I said, that we may forget about a region, a region for which we still bear responsibility, and a region where we have three good friends as the ones in our panel, which I hope you join me in thanking. <laughs>